Welcome to episode 136 of Real Health Radio. You can find the links talked about as part of this episode at the show notes, which is www7, so the word all spelled out, S-E-V-E-N, hyphenhealth.com forward slash 136. Welcome to Real Health Radio. Health advice that's more than just about how you look. And here's your host, Chris Sandel. Hey guys, welcome back and thanks for joining me for another episode of Real Health Radio. So once again, uh, this week is a guest episode and my guest is Rupert Pugsley. So Rupert studied marketing and business management after finishing school and then spent a decade or a bit more than a decade working in the soft drinks industry, working for Pepsi and then for Red Bull. Uh, About three years ago, he went back to school to pursue his interest in psychology and doing a double master's in psychology and then occupational and organizational psychology. And as a researcher, he's focused largely on authenticity at work. Uh, with the title of his most recent paper being Examining the Relationship of Trust in Coworkers with Authenticity at Work and Imposter Phenomenon. And Rupert is passionate about helping people discover who they are and how they can be their true self at work. So Rupert is actually a friend of mine. Uh, we first met at Glastonbury Music Festival of all places uh, back in, it was either 2010 or, or 2011. Uh, Rupert was still living in Sydney at the time, but was over on holiday and we got introduced uh, via a mutual friend and then he moved over to the UK in 2012 and him and his partner Chrissy became part of our group of friends. Um, but it's Rupert's more recent endeavours of doing a double masters in psychology that made me reach out to him. So earlier in the year, we were chatting about his course, and he mentioned that he's been looking at authenticity and imposter phenomenon, and it sounded both interesting and relevant. And then more recently, I got in contact, and he sent over his dissertation, uh, which I read, and that's why I then asked him to come on the show. So as part of this episode, we chat a little about Rupert's life and how he found his way to go back to university and and study psychology in his mid-30s. We then focus on the areas that Rupert has looked at the most, which is authenticity, uh, imposter phenomenon, or as most people know it, imposter syndrome, and then trust. And Rupert's focus with these has largely been uh, in the workplace, but he's also able to talk about them more broadly. And as part of this, we then touch on other ideas like self-awareness, benevolence, integrity, and and much more. So for me, this show is a a really good overview of what these different terms mean, uh, what the research shows about them, and and where applicable, uh, what are ways that you can be improving the situation. Uh, rather annoyingly, uh, when I recorded the conversation, my computer decided to record the audio from the built-in microphone um, at, m- at my end rather than my nice, expensive, proper microphone that I use for podcast. Uh, so the sound at my end is very tinny and like I'm, I don't know, sitting at the back of a shed. Uh, I've tried my best to improve it, but it is what it is. Uh, you can clearly make out what I'm saying. It just lacks the, the usual sound quality. Uh, so that is it for the intro. Here is my conversation with Rupert Pugsley. Hey, Rupert. Welcome to the show. Hey, Chris. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So look, part of the reason I invited you on the show is to talk about your master's dissertation called Examining the Relationship of Trust in Coworkers with Authenticity at Work and Imposter Phenomenon. And so I want to explore many of the topics that you touched on as part of that paper uh, like imposter phenomenon and authenticity and trust and many others. And, and I want to do that in the context of the workplace, but also the, the research uh, more broadly. And as part of this as well, I want you to cover like your story and how this fits into your work life and your decision to study psychology and, and what you're hoping to do with this newly learned information. And we've been friends for, for we were kind of just trying to work this out before we hit record for, for nearly eight years. I think we met at Glastonbury through some mutual friends of all places. Um, but I'm hoping as part of this that I'll find out bits and pieces about your life that I've never discovered before because we're now having this conversation. So that's the, the outline for today. Um, and so I guess to start with, do you want to give just a brief introduction of, of who you are, what you do, what your qualifications are, and then we can dive into that in, in more detail? 
Cool. So, um, as you can probably tell from my accent, um, I am as well. I was raised in Australia. I was actually born in London, um, and my parents migrated to Australia when I was five. So, grew up um, all childhood, teenage years, and into my twenties in Australia. Um, and then my partner and I transferred. Well, I transferred with work to London um, in 2012, just before the Olympics, because I wanted to come back and live here. I'd always had a strong emotional connection to the UK and to Europe and wanted to come and, you know, experience living here full time. Um, and we've obviously been here, you know, since, as I said, just before the Olympics. Um, Work-wise, I uh, originally started a business degree at the University of Tasmania straight after school. Um, and then I spent best part of 12 years, 10 or 12 years working in the soft drinks industry in um, places like Pepsi and also Red Bull. Um, and Red Bull was a company that I trained transferred over with and during that time I was always in commercial commercially led roles you know sales strategy um, uh, category management which is basically you know looking at um, you know a whole soft drinks category rather than a specific brand but the and whilst I enjoyed it you know as I got further along in my career and I um, you know moved into more management positions or the my focus obviously very much turned to people in the, you know, underneath me. Um, and what I realized was that I really enjoyed that part of um, my role rather than the commercial side. The commercial side, you know, still provided me with a level of fulfillment, but working with people in a team and um, trying to understand their behaviors and their habits and, um, you know, just the, how, how they process things, you know, was a point of real interest for me. So for me, it was about, um, right, well, this is what's given me fulfillment. And then as my career went on, I was getting to a point where I was like, um, uh, you know, work isn't, the, the corporate environment isn't giving me the fulfillment that I really, you know, really wanted and really desired. And so uh, two and a half years ago now, I made the decision to um, jump ship from the corporate world and I uh, embarked on two master's degrees at the University of East London. One of them was in um, psychology, so it's a conversion course, so basically for anybody who's got an interest in psychology and wants to study it but has never studied psychology before. Um, and then the second master's I've, um, I've done is in occupational psychology. Um, and as a little, I guess, overlapping that at the same time, I had a strange experience where one of my or our close friends um, had an idea for a soft drink um, literally the same time as I was leaving Red Bull, he kind of said in passing and I said, look, if you need a hand, you know, more than happy to help out. Um, but fast forward two and a half years and we now have a startup soft drink, soft drink business. So, you know, concurrently of um, studying these two masters, I've also set up a soft drink business. So um, to answer, I think another part of your question was where does this all going to lead? Initially, it was going to go down you know, I guess the similar path to what you've gone down of, you know, becoming a consultant, um, you know, and working one-on-one -on -one with people and also with businesses about how we can or how I can add value into them in terms of getting the best out of the people and making sure that they're fulfilled and also the business is achieving what it wants. Um, that's gone a little bit to the side because of now I've got a soft drink business, but the plus side of now having a startup business is that I, I've basically got a live, um, a live experiment in front of me where I can trial all these different um, theories and um, thoughts and ideas that both me and my business partner have, you know, in a live environment to see to see whether they um, see whether they work. And so, with that decision to to go back and study psychology and occupational psychology, were there other areas that you thought about studying or was that just like a really obvious place? Uh, so I guess my journey towards psychology, um, well, in, in essence, it, it came from just having a deep interest in humans, you know, and really, um, you know, wanting to know about, you know, human behavior and human decision making and what motivates people, what um, drives people, you know, all you know, a whole range of facets of human behaviour. But I guess for me, because business and work had been such a dominant part of my life, you know, that's where 
the I guess the interest really focused on is like, you know, within a work environment, how can you know people? First of all, it, it, it was based around how can people perform best, but then what as my um, knowledge and my experiences have evolved over the past few years, it's really turned into like, how can people be fulfilled at work? You know, really, um, you know, experience that sense of, I guess, purpose, you know, at work, but also that, you know, those warm fuzzies of going to work and yeah, obviously performing, but also, you know, making sure that, that it's tapping into something higher than just, you know, achieving. Definitely. And I think there's certain aspects as part of that, that I I want to touch on because of your research, but also probably some of the other research you did as, as part of getting into doing that dissertation. But I just want to find out, is there other times or other parts of your life that you could think of that would link into that interest in psychology or that interest in, in human behavior that you were talking about? Yeah, a hundred percent. So you know, I guess everyone is, you know, a product of their experience. So for me to end up, you know, with a deep interest that now have studied psychology for the past two years, you know, I, I can track it all the way back to, you know, my experience, you know, from being a toddler, you know. At, uh, so when I was um, uh, three or four years of age, I was still living in London and my parents sent me to a school called St. James. Now, St. James' um, philosophy is based on um, a school of philosophy called um, the School of Economic Science. Um, the, the basis, I won't go into a huge amount of detail about it, but the basis of the School of Economic Science is all it has its foundations in uh, Hinduism, you know, in, in Eastern, I won't say religion, but more Eastern spirituality. Um, so from a practice standpoint, we would meditate between each class, um, we would share meals, and I don't mean in the sense of like um, just uh, like a canteen style um, setting for meals. We would actually sit down and be like serve food. So it'd be nearly like having a meal with your family, um, uh, with traditional, I guess, having a meal with your family. Um, and the reason why I got sent to that school, obviously my parents and predominantly my mum was really interested in um, – you know, just Eastern spirituality. You know, I had a chat to her the other day about, you know, how it ended up with that. And it was as simple as, you know, it was just that um, she'd obviously grown up in, the, you know, the 60s and the 70s when, you know, Eastern culture, you know, really boomed in the UK and she was British. So, um, you know, she, she just got a, a – a, she just found a natural interest in it. And then sure. it was as simple as a friend – um, making comment about this school called the School of Economic Science, and then from going to some, uh, you know, dropping classes there, she found out about the school, and so I went there. And then only after I think I did a year or a year and a bit at this school, and then I had a quite a a big adjustment because when we went to Australia, I got put into a, a, a completely different school in terms of philosophy. So the school that I went to was in um, the eastern suburbs of Sydney. And for those that don't know Sydney too well, eastern suburbs is a very affluent area. Um, the school that I went to is right in the heart of, of that. Um, there was kids there and families there, you know, which who were very, very wealthy. And whilst we we're obviously, you know, fortunate enough and wealthy enough for me to go there, you know, we, we paled in, in comparison to the wealth that some of the other students had. You know, and that, that school and the people at that school had completely different value systems and behaviours than yeah. what the school I'd been used to as a three- or four-year-old, you know, and in those key development you know, ages of, you know, zero to seven, you know, a dramatic shift like that, you know, it can have a huge bearing on a child. And, you know, having experienced one thing where I'm meditating between classes and then going into a, a school that's very machoistic, you know, huge fo- focus on sports, um, little interest, you know, but uh, had some level of interest in drama. But, you know, it was all about the, the strongest and the fittest, you know, and the smartest. So it, it, those two experiences, are, you know, really, you know, clashed. And flash forward, you know, to now, and I guess over the last 10 years as I've learned, learned more and more about who I am, it was – you know, that, that was a confused – it's resulted in, you know, a high degree of confusion in, um, you know, who I am and, you know, what I believe because 
my whole life from sort of six years of age to nearly 24, 25 was dominant due to, you know, that experience I had at that school in Sydney. Um, and then what happened was that I was at a, uh, I was at a, on a course for work and very randomly this, the, the teacher came up to me and said, I think you'd be, you'd have great interest in going to this thing called Vipassana meditation. I don't even know. I can't even recall how he realized that um, I obviously had meditated when I was very young. Mum had always had a sort of general interest in spirituality, but not a, not not anything of you know nothing overt. And he kind of planted the seed in my you know sort of early mid twenties of you know, maybe I should go back and explore this experience that I had um, as a toddler. Yeah, and um, that really set me on this course. Over the, you know, I'm now in my late 30s, over the last sort of 15 years of, you know, really discovering, you know, authenticity. And as you mentioned in my, um, in the intro, you know, that that's my passion area and what two of both my dissertations have been on is around, you know, authentic self. And, you know, it, there's clearly a correlation for me between, you know, that experience of, you know, meditating and then having that completely different school to go to and then really identifying, well, who am I? And, you know, what does it mean to be authentic? Um, because, you know, I've had my own, you know, negative mental health experiences, you know, at work. And what I realized was it was a product of me not feeling authentic whilst being in those situations. Um, so, you know, that's how I, that, I guess that's a long winded story of how I, ended up, you know, studying psychology and studying, especially, you know, all being authentic or what does it mean to be authentic? Yeah. And it's interesting you, you mentioned about the Vipassana meditation because it's kind of easy to forget now where it feels like meditation has become so much more mainstream and it feels like quite a normal thing that 15 years ago, meditation wasn't like the rage that it is now so for someone to make that recommendation is would have felt a lot more out of left field than it would these days yeah it, it was kind of serendipitous i guess in some way because you know he clearly saw something in me or from what i had been saying to say oh, i think this guy would be really interested in this um because i definitely wasn't meditating at the time you know i uh, you know i realized its benefits and i definitely you know, it was in my space, but it wasn't, I wasn't directly experiencing it. And it was still, I should say, it was still probably three more years of, you know, of just after that seed had been planted before I actually went. And for those that don't know about um, the passion of meditation is, you know, it, it's, it's quite ex extreme in the sense of, you know, if you're doing it for the first time that I hadn't meditated at all. And then what you do for the passion is that you go and sit in silence for 10 days, you know, and so you you actually are meditating in a big hall with, you know, 150, 100, 200 people. And, um, you know, for, for anywhere between an hour and three hours at a time for 10 hours a day. But then when you have your breaks and at the evening, you still, you're not allowed to talk to anybody. And I mean, not, not just verbally talk, but you're not allowed to communicate with your eyes, with actions, you know, whatever it might be. So you know, it is an intense experience. You've got no pens, nothing to write on, nothing to read. It's literally just for 10 days, you and your head. Um, and it, it, it is a, it's very, very tough. It's, ex, it's exhausting. It's a strange experience. So, you know, I guess, um, you know, throwing myself in at the deep end like that, um, you know, it just, it worked for me, you know, and it's, now that's not to say that, we'll, we, you know, everybody's different. So, you know, for, but for me at that time, I kind of felt like to reconnect with this experience that I had so many years ago, I needed to kind of dive into the deep end to kickstart, you know, those, you know, those learnings and experience that I had so many years prior. Okay. And so let's then switch and, and chat about the, the actual research. So as part of your research, you've touched on a number of different ideas. And as I said at the start, I want to explore them both sort of broadly in terms of all of the research around and, and what reading you did and what you can remember around that. And it might include different models as part of different areas, yeah. uh, but also then just more narrowly in terms of what your research found or, or more in the, in the workplace. So I guess let's start with authenticity because that's one you've you've made reference to already. So I mean, 
can you give a definition for authenticity or how would you, you start off talking about authenticity? Yeah, so authenticity, very from a general terms, is um, the sense of feeling that you're aligned to your true self. You know, is that um, you know feeling of being in you know a variety of situations and feeling comfortable with who you are. Um, and the model that I refer to, that I use in my research, is one um, by uh, Wood, was the primary author, um, and uh, it basically breaks breaks authenticity down into three components. Um, the first is one which they call um, self-alienation. And what it basically means is that uh, how – they look at it from a negative perspective, but inverting it and looking at a positive perspective, it's basically internally how – aligned are you to how or who you are or how you feel so it's got nothing to do with your actions it's all internal process so what are my values you know and how closely aligned do I feel that I am to them you know that's that's the very first component the second component is what they call authentic living and that's meaning that how do my the way that I live my life and how do my actions align with how do I feel so a, am I aligned to who I am in terms of my values? B, am I aligned to do my actions aligned to how I feel? And then the third one, um, third component of the model is called accepting external influences. Now, there is a little bit of conjecture about um, this third component. Uh, originally, um, the authors proposed that people that um, accept external influences weren't um, being as authentic as they as they could be because they were influenced by external factors. What the research is showing, um, both my research found and also some other research that's um, happened over the past couple of years is that, you know, is there, there's uh, the other point of view is that people can be, people who are being authentic arguably are more accepting of external influences because they allow themselves to be um, persuaded in different directions. Is to say, um, I, I know I'm this and I'm this, this is who I am and I'm feeling authentic, but, you know, Chris has a different opinion. You know, he's communicated that to me and, you know what, I actually, I now agree with him, you know, so it's not seen as a negative. It's saying, you know, I've listened, I'm, I'm aware of myself, I'm aware of the point, I'm aware of the way that the point's been presented and actually I've been externally influenced by that and I'm going to shift in that direction rather than I don't feel, you know, who I am, I'm, you know, I'm, and I'm just like Chris has given me an idea and I've just jumped on and run off in a direction. So it's, it's a slight, you know, it's just a different way of looking at the two things. I as I said, my research would indicate that it's the newer way of looking at it is that people who are being authentic can be um, influenced by external um, by stimuli people um, rather than being inauthentic and being externally influenced as being a negative. Okay. So, I mean, that, that last point being to just open to, to new ideas and then kind of matching up with, okay, well, how does that now sit with me? And if it sits with you, then you can change your opinion. Of course, absolutely. And one of the um, recommendations, you know, I, I put forward in my paper was, you know, on the measurement tool that's being asked, you know, is, to, is whether you can, the, the tool, the measurement tool could tighten up the, the, the way the question is asked. So, you know, just generally rather than saying, you know, uh, and this isn't the wording of the, of the question, but like, are you influenced by external influ influences, you know, is, you know, something along those lines, but at the end of it, say, you know, which don't align to your values or something like that. So, you know, it's when someone gives you an external, um, external reference point, if it aligns to who you are, will you still allow yourself to be influenced by it, you know, and remain authentic? And so then authenticity at work. So how does, how does that then kind of go a little bit deeper into authenticity? Yeah, so authenticity at work. So um, I guess my, you know, interest in this is, as I touched on before, is that I um, had been, had experiences where I didn't feel authentic at work, you know, and when I was working in Sydney, I was living on the south side of the bridge and my um, office was on the north side of the bridge. And every day as I drove to work, I would feel, you know, like a veil of, a veil of a new self come over me and 
what it would do, it'd, be, it'd put me in this heightened state, anywhere from just like a general uneasiness right through to having a full-blown panic attack, you know, and like nearly blanking out. And so, you know, and as I've studied it over the past, you know, two years, is that's exactly what happens is that, you know, um, the research shows that um, authenticity, the best way to think about authenticity, it runs on a continuum. So it's not a, authenticity isn't like a global phenomena. It's more of a, it's more state based. So your, your authenticity can shift along this continuum where at one end you can feel fully authentic and then the other end you can feel fully inauthentic. Um, and depending on the people you're with and the situation that you're in, you move along this continuum. Um, and obviously, the further um, towards feeling fully inauthentic you get, the greater the chance of, you know, um, negative impacts to your well-being and to your experience. Um, so, you know, what you obviously anybody wants to be doing is trying to keep themselves as close to feeling fully authentic across a whole range of different experiences, not just in the workplace, but, you know, in any situation, whether it be, you know, home or social, um, because the closer you are to feeling fully authentic in any situation, you know, the, the greater, um, you know, opportunity of having positive wellbeing. Sure. And so you mentioned that, that if you're more inauthentic, there can be negative outcomes alongside that. I mean, what, what are some of those just so people can, can maybe think if, if that's their situation? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, uh, generally is, you know, you can just have a general sense of, you know, anxiety, you know, a, a sense of, you know, just feeling uneasy and uncomfortable, you know, in the situation that in, um, you can experience emotional exhaustion, you know, because when you're in a situation that doesn't feel comfortable and you don't feel that you can be yourself, you know, it, it, it draws on your, your emotional capacity and your emotional, you know, store. So, you know, that can, you know, that can um, obviously have a big negative effect, affect your well-being. Specific within a work environment, you know, those negative effects to well-being also have a flow-on effect to, you know, your job satisfaction, your relationships at work, your work engagement, um, you know, uh, your intent to, you know, leave the role, you know, leave the job that you're in if you're not feeling, um, you know, fully authentic in it. So, you know, that it can have a huge dramatic effect if you can't feel authentic within the situations that you find yourself in. And was there any um, advice that then came out of the research, and this could be more generally or it could it be a, in the work environment of like how to feel more authentic or how to be more authentic in, in certain situations? Yeah, so so the and, – and this is true not just for my research but, you know – all the research which has looked at this is that the, the dominant component, you know, of, of how someone feels more authentic is is the first component, is is the is the alignment of how you feel internally. You know, and that is uh, was the biggest takeaway for me, not not just from a research standpoint, but also from my own personal experiences, you know, the more that you can get to know who you are as a person, you know, the way you behave, the way you feel in situations, your values, you know, all, all those facets of your personality. And the more that you realise, and I should touch on it, it's not just the good bits of you, but it's also knowing the bad bits of you or the negative parts of, you know, your personality. The more that you can better understand that, the more you're prepared to, to allow yourself to feel authentic in, all, in a range of different um, in a range of different situations. And I mean, that's a lot of the work that I then do with people in terms of getting to understand, okay, what is your identity? What is your values? What are your priorities? What are your beliefs? And, and really starting to understand that. And as you say, looking at the things that are, are positive or looking at the things that are not so nice to look at. But yeah, that that self-awareness and that knowledge of um, of what is important and, and who we are, et cetera, I think is is really key. It is, and, and and it is so easy to say and so hard to do. You know, <laughs> yes. people do this for life. You know, their whole lifetime mm. trying to understand. You know, who you are, and um, you know, it, it. There are so many distractions. You know, in everybody's life. You know, from family. You know, paying bills 
stresses at work, um, social media, you know, all these things are pulling us away from learning, you know, about who we are or taking the time to, you know, sit down and think, right, well, how, why, why did I feel that way when that experience happened? Yeah. Um, you know, and obviously, um, you know, keeping a diary, you know, is for me is one of the best things that a person can do just to, you know, get those thoughts out of it on paper. And you know, your, your, uh, you know, from my own experience, you know, this year, you know, I've, uh, it's been a busy year because, you know, I was studying the masters and writing the dissertation and starting this business, you know, and the way that I've behaved in some situations, you know, I've, I've reflected on, and I'm like, that wasn't, that wasn't good. You know, what, why, why did I behave that way in that situation? And it's about, you know, not having, not, I'm not, I don't, I don't ever, and I don't think anybody should be judging themselves for behaving that way, but it's about unpicking it, you know, trying to understand it. And yeah. I think, you know, you can, you can do that by yourself, definitely by, I said, just sitting and reflecting, meditating possibly by keeping a journal. But I think it's also then really important, you know, to have someone else to talk to, you know, whether that be a close friend who can hold a space for you just to talk and not try and solve the problem, you yeah. know, it's just empathizing with the person. I think, and that's one of the, I think one of the risks of, um, you know, friendship and connection is so important, but depending on where the person's at with their mental health, you know, I, I, I'm a just, I'm a true believer in, you know, um, you know, in therapy. And as you said, you know, you, you, what, you know, you offer that, you know, not traditional psychotherapy, but getting people just to understand who they are, yeah. you know, is hugely valuable, you know, to them. I think it's probably the most valuable thing because, you know, the more connect, the deeper the connection you have with yourself, you know, it then uh, stems off like a tree, you know, into whole different branches of your life, into into how it can, you know, you can live a more fulfilled life and a, and a happier life. Yeah, I agree. So next next one that I wanted to touch on was uh, imposter phenomenon, which most people know as imposter syndrome. So do you want to just talk a little bit about this? Yeah, so, um, yeah, imposter phenomenon. As you said, it's also known as um, imposter syndrome and uh, just a little anecdote about why um, I've termed imposter phenomenon is because the um, the two authors who found uh, found imposter phenomenon back in the late, well, the mid-'80s, um, two women found it and initially they saw it as um, uh, experience that um, – affected uh women far more than men and what they what they said at the time was you know we don't want women to have another negative experience otherwise a syndrome so that's why um they termed it imposter phenomenon obviously over the course of the last 25 odd years the term has turned into imposter syndrome but um technically that's why it's called imposter phenomenon um and what basically it is it's um a person's um, experience of feeling like a phony, of feeling like a fake. And the reason why um, they experience is because they can't internalise their successful experiences. So um, it can happen in different situations, but obviously I look to the, you know, very much the work situation and, and the vast majority of the research to date has um, focused on the work situation. Um, and then I guess to talk you through, I guess what they term the imposter cycle is that someone starts a task and then um, from that point in task, they feel like anxiety, they start, um, they have self-doubt, they have worry, all those negative experiences. And then what will happen is uh, there's kind of like then two strands of experience. They'll either heavily procrastinate um, or they'll heavily over-prepare, like extremely, extremely over-prepare. Um, and then they'll then do, they'll then finish the task and they'll present the task and then what they'll get is they'll – because these people – one note that I'm left out was that these people are, on the whole, very high achievers. So they'll, they'll do the task. They'll do it to a very high standard. They'll get really positive feedback. And then if someone is suffering from imposter phenomenon, at that point of getting positive feedback, 
they'll their mind will do a couple of things. One of them is that they'll discount it. They'll just like push it to a side. That didn't happen. Um, they'll put it down to luck. Wasn't me. My hard work. My hard work was you know it had no effect. It was just chance. Um, and then they then basically that then starts a negative loop of um, feelings and experiences where they, you know, can get anxious, the self-doubt starts, you know, getting stronger. Um, and even though they've had, even though they've had this positive experience and then the loop basically starts again, they get another tasks, they act on it, you know, then they over-prepare, they procrastinate, they get positive ex- um, feedback they then discount it or they push it to luck or chance and then the loop, you know, they go through those negative emotions and they start again. And so this literally just continues to compound and compound and compound. And um, as I said, the phenomenon when it was first identified 30-odd years ago, you know, was seen to be um, like heavily dominant in women. Um, but what we find now, and, and my, my research, my research did skew, like uh, females did experience imposter phenomenon more than men, but that's not to say that men didn't. You know, there's still a high proportion of men who experienced imposter phenomenon. And overall, there was a um, some research done about 10 years ago that, you know, as high as 70% of the population experienced imposter phenomenon. And it's definitely something that, you know, is probably becoming more in the discourse. You know, I, I, I only actually found out about it about 18 months, two years ago when, um, you know, a close friend who was, I was helping at the time, you know, described it to me and I was like, wow, that's such an interesting experience and something that I have experienced as well, you know? Um, and you know, you start talking to people about it and you realize how prevalent it is. Like all, you know, so many people just having this experience of, that wasn't due to me, you know, that was due to some other reason, but it, it wasn't due to me. And is there a, a cutoff with it? Because, I mean, you said it, it happens with people who are knowledgeable or uh, higher up in their field or further along. Because, I mean, a lot of what could be described as imposter syndrome or would feel kind of similar is someone starting out any new task. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, part of the structure – um, to overcome, um, I guess, my research, uh, you know, being um, tainted by people who, you know, I guess were in those first few months of work was to, um, in my research, only for people who had been enrolled for over 12 months okay. um, to complete the tool. So, um, yeah, and that, and that gets away. Like, obviously, it's natural to start something, especially a new role, and feel like a fake, to feel like a phony. You're like, well, I can't do this. This is me. Um, but then over time, naturally, you know, most people experience as they um, – get more equipped with understanding what the role is and what the work is and the people around them. They get more comfortable with the work that they're doing. And, you know, obviously those feelings of phoniness, a feeling, you know, that that the effort or the results aren't due to them, you know, are pushed to the side. And then there's this other, um, which I found one of the most interesting parts of the, the research that I did, you know, th- there's now research to show that there's, two types of imposters, those which are called um, uh, real imposters and those which are called strategic imposters. Now, strategic imposters basically claim that they experience, um, you know, that, that, that they basically say uh, it's not it's not due to me, you know, they act very humble, they, um, you know, they, they basically say, you know, th- th- this work you know, it, it, like I said, it's not down to me. But what they don't experience is all the negative or other emotions. They don't experience the anxiety. They don't experience the self-doubt. You know, they don't experience, um, you know, the, the real depression, the anxiety, the fraud, the true imposters do. And the reason why strategic imposters do this is broadly likability is because the, you know, humility is, you know, is a great connector, you know, is if people see other people in the work environment saying, you know, just being modest and, you know, saying, right, you know, that that's a good job, but, you know, it's not due to me, then, you know, that, that can be quite a likable um, behavior, personality trait. Yeah. You know, so that's why they do it. So again, in, and there was the way that you identify these strategic imposters is you put a, um, a stress test 
you know, into the measurement tools. And so once the results get um, spat out, you then say, right, well, if you're a, if you if you score highly on the imposter phenomenon test, but you score low on the anxiety test, then the likelihood is that you're not a true imp- imposter. You know that you're you're exhibiting more strategic imposters. That you know you're exhibiting traits of being an imposter, but again, you basically are fine. You know you're fine in the sense of you know you're not suffering any negative um, well-being effects. Sure. And so with this one, is there any advice um, that's come out of the research in terms of if you do suffer with imposter syndrome, these, or sorry, imposter phenomenon, um, these are the things that you should be doing or these things can, can be helping? Yeah, we're, we're, I, I don't want to sound like I'm just, you know, regurgitating, you know, to, to keep things simple, but, you know, the, the imposter phenomenon, you know, is really based, you know, in – uh, high levels of self-doubt, you know, and, and, you know, lack of self-belief, you know, and, you know, to explore that as a, you know, as an individual, you know, you really then have to go back to, you know, understanding who you are, you know, so as with authenticity and how do I feel authentic, it's about going back and saying, right, well, what is it about, um, you know, what I'm doing and how I'm feeling that's, that's not allowing me to believe in the work that I'm, you know, that I'm doing. Um, now that's, that's a huge task to do. And I, and I definitely don't think it's something that, you know, especially at the, you know, the, at the stronger end, something that someone could go through by themselves. So, you know, the recommendations that I make in the paper is you know, for organizations to be very aware and very, Um, you know, on the lookout for people who might be exhibiting these negative emotions, you know, people that feel, you know, who are suffering from any degree of, you know, anxiousness, who, you know, might be even showing signs of depression, you know, all those, you know, self-doubt, those worry, you know, is is not just to cast them or, you know, brush over it and just say, you know, that that's just who that person is, is to sit down and say, right, well, let's, let's support that person. Let's, and, you know, let's create an emotionally safe space for people to feel comfortable to come up to somebody, whether it be their manager, their coach, their mentor, um, HR, you know, and say, look, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I, I don't, whilst I'm getting this positive feedback, I don't feel like, you know, it's due to the work that I'm doing. Um, you know, and I guess that's the first, that's the first step of that journey of, you know, making people, allowing people the space to come forward and saying, you know, I'm not in a good place. Yeah. Um, and then from that, you know, from, from that position, you then obviously can make decisions about, well, is this something we can you know, manage internally or if it's something more extreme, you know, is it something that we need to, you know, bring someone in with you no know, greater experience and, you know, um, someone who's been trained, you know, to, you know, work with people who may be suffering some of those experiences. Yeah. Definitely. And it's, it's interesting, whenever I think of imposter phenomenon, I, I have that at one end of the spectrum, and then I have like the, the Dunning-Kruger effect at the other end of the spectrum, which is kind of flipping it on its head, someone who, who knows very little but feels like they know everything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and um, yeah, like I said, you know, this, this, ex, this is an experience, you know, a, a phenomenal experience by, you know, 70% of the population, you know, so it's important for people to understand. And I definitely feel, obviously, it's one of those experiences for me that, you know, I spent so much time on it, I feel like it's becoming more prevalent in the discourse of, you know, what's going on, you know, in the community. But, you know, I think, you know, the more that can be done around it, you know, the better it is, because, you know, you don't want, especially in a work environment, and just from a, a human point of view, you know, for someone to experience you know to feel like they're a phony or a fake you know is is a huge burden to bear um so you know anything organizations can do to relieve some of that you know is only a good thing not only for the individual but also for the organization yeah agreed so let's move on to the next one and talk a bit about trust and propensity to trust and and yeah you can you can start with that yeah so trust is another um yeah another quite complex theory um, of made up of multiple components. Um, so I guess broadly, um, and obviously I looked specifically at trust and coworkers, but um, 
broadly trust is just basically the willingness of a person to be vulnerable to the actions of others. You know, so do I want to expose myself to, you know, the actions of someone else? You know, am I prepared to take that risk and be vulnerable? Um, and obviously people, and I should say obviously, but people who are more more vulnerable um, and open themselves up to these things, uh, to the, you know, to, to connections with others, you know, do experience, you know, positive well-being and organisations, you know, experience, um, you know, the benefits of that through performance and culture. Um, but in terms of the components, there's um, three main components and one of the components broke down into another three factors. Um, the first factor is a global factor, so it doesn't change based on um, – you know, the situations you're in, and that's um, a person's propensity to trust. So just generally, do you trust others? Um, no matter who they are, whether it's, you know, just a stranger on the street, I was going to say someone in a, a, a someone working in a bank, but may, maybe that's not the best, <laughs> the, the best example. But, you know, across any situation, do you, do you have a high propensity of trusting or a low propensity of trusting others? And then, um, in terms of the next component, which is more situation based, is there is a um, is perceiving a person's trustworthiness. Now, this then breaks down to three separate factors. The first is within the situations, do you perceive the person's um, what? How, how to what degree do you perceive the person's ability within that situation? The second is what's their benevolence to you? So, how, how, do you perceive them that they're going to be kind? to you and the third is um do you you know what, what how do you perceive their level of integrity so basically do your values align with the other person's values and then the third component um is the intention to trust so not the actual trusting itself but based on your propensity to trust and based on the your um perce perception of trustworthiness do you then have an intention to trust um, and then, um, sorry, I was forgot what I was going to say. So I'll, I'll hand it back over to you. <laughs> sure. And with, with just with the trust side, is it always trust looking at looking outwards in terms of trusting others versus trusting oneself? Would like the, the trusting oneself would that be more the authenticity piece? Uh, yeah. So the research itself was about trusting. Well, the, my research specifically was about trusting coworkers, okay. and all the research that I um, read, you know, in preparation for writing my paper was about trust in others. So trust in leadership and, like, trust in your romantic partner was another one. Um, and, the, you know, the results across whether the different situations, whether it be trust in leaders, trust in coworkers, trust in your romantic partner, were all broadly the same. You know, the, 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 you know, the higher the trust that you have in someone, um, the greater positive benefit that'll have on to your have on your life, and obviously on the relationship that you have with that person. Um, so, and the other, sorry, the the other point that I was going to make was that you know trust is very dynamic. So, um, the thing about uh, propensity to trust, propensity to trust quickly gets um, overtaken, overruled by a person assessing another person's trustworthiness. So if you've got high or low propensity to trust, as soon as you engage with someone, and I mean like engage as in like within the first couple of minutes, you are, you are collecting stimuli based on that person, what they're saying, how they're acting, their behaviours, their facial expressions, you know, all those types of things. So then you know, the the more time you spend on you spend with these people, and and you know, obviously the the actions and the behaviours that they take, depending on the situations you're in, you are constantly weighing up. Right, what's the person's ability within this situation? You know, if it's if they've got a high ability, will I trust them more? You know, have they shown me kindness, or do I perceive them to be kind to me? You know, and therefore, will I trust them? And the same with integrity. You know, you know, constantly weighing up someone's actions as you know do. Does their actions, you know, align with, you know, or the values that I perceive them to have through their actions align with the values that I've got? And is there anything in the research looking at, I don't know, you go over some tipping point with trustworthiness where it suddenly becomes a negative? 
So I don't know, you, you become so open to trust people that, that maybe those other factors aren't taken into consideration. And so you're, I don't know, you're more likely to be duped or something along those lines. I th- we, uh, there, I, there's, uh, there is some research in this. You know, it's not something that I, you know, I, I focused on a lot in the paper. But, yeah, there, obviously there's, you know, you can be too trusting, you know, and, and that's why, you know, that's not to say that you want to pull back on, um, you know, not on your vulnerability, but it's about just being aware of, you know, the people that you're engaging with, you know, and ensuring that, you know, based on those three subcomponents of ability, benevolence, integrity, you know, are you weighing up the level of trustworthiness in that person based on those factors? Are there, I mean, I, I know I just mentioned about the fact that you could be too trusting and there could be a problem with that, but what are the benefits of trusting people? And, and again, this can be romantic partners or it could be trusting coworkers. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the key benefits and, like you say, some of these are, I guess, global benefits and some of them are more specific to the work environment, but one of them is information sharing. So, you know, just the level of communication and also the depth of communication that you have within a relationship, um, whether it be a co-worker or a romantic um, relationship, for example. Um, Within the context of an organisation, if there's greater trusting relationships between people, what it's been shown is that that then converts into greater trust within the organisation. So there's a nice flow on effect of, you know, there's this trust between co-workers or leaders and then that flows up to trust in, um, you know, greater trust in the organisation as a whole. Um, and then generally, you know, it's it just it generally improved um, psychological well-being, you know, lower stress, lower anxiety, um, and then obviously from a working impact you know work work situation that then flows through to greater job satisfaction higher engagement um you know which obviously then have flow on effects to um you know performance and fulfillment and you know other other positive areas both for the individual and for the organization and so are there other i'm I'm trying to think back to to the paper are there other areas that we haven't chatted about that that you want to mention I, i think it covers self-awareness but i don't know if that's uh just part of the authenticity piece yeah i think you know i I, as i as i touched on you know the the key takeout of you know the research you know especially when it comes to you know authenticity and imposter phenomenon but you know and also you know with trust is that you know again and i don't want to be repeating myself but at the same time you know it is probably the most important piece to come out of all of this is you know, it's just knowing yourself, you know, and, and having that self-awareness, you know, of, of, of who you are and how you experience things in, in a variety of, of different uh, different um, situations, whether it be, you know, socially, at work, um, just generally, you know, um, you know, meeting people in your day-to-day. You know, how, how do you respond um, to different situations? You know, does it make you anxious? Does it make you happy? Does it make you angry? You know, because... The more that you know yourself in a variety of different situations, the more that you can align um, your actions to those. You know, you can adapt based on how you're feeling and, you know, what the, how the situation presents itself. And then as I talked about, that obviously has benefits of, you know, therefore you're feeling more, you know, authentic, um, you know, from, you know, it then has a flow and effect for, in terms of it being, you know, feeling in, uh, you know, suffering any experience from feeling like an imposter, you know, the more that you know yourself and you can um, overcome any of those sense of like lack of um, self-belief, um, feeling of self-doubt, you know, the, the more positive experience that you'll have. And then, um, you know, thinking about that from a trust point of view also is, you know, if you, if you take the component of integrity, you know, to assess another person's, um, you know, values you have to know your own values, you know, so it's very hard to assess something if you don't have a point to assess it against. So, you know, if, if you know, your, your ability to perceive the integrity of another person and then weigh it up against who you are as your person is obviously going to be far easier and, and, you know, far more fruitful if, you know, you've spent time understanding who you are yeah. um, and, and understanding, you know, the lights and shades of, you know, your, your personality Definitely. And so one of the other things that you talk about in the paper 
is about the, the flattening of work hierarchies and the fact that the, the, the levels aren't there that they were in the past. So can you talk about this and maybe how it impacts on um, the, the other areas we've chatted about in terms of uh, imposter phenomenon and authenticity, et cetera? Yeah, definitely. So the, as I touched on at the start of the chat, you know, the, the, I guess the primary inspiration for this was, you know, my own experience of, you know, feeling authentic, you know, and or feeling inauthentic more likely at, you know, at work. But what I also experienced and what I, um, you know, had heard and from friends and from business associates and also I was starting to read in, you know, business journals and things like that, you know, was you know, that there's many different organisational structures starting to appear. One of them, um, you know, obviously that's happening is, you know, f- a flatter organisational structure. Obviously there's less middle management and there's also um, it being decentralised. You know, and what this means is that when you remove those layers, you know, there are benefits of that. You know, the communication can flow a lot more easy. Decisions can be made a lot faster. You know, the link from, you know, the real senior leaders within the organisation down to the coalface, you know, is a lot smaller. So they can be far more hands-on in terms of, you know, understanding what the challenges are and what the opportunities are. And, you know, that can therefore make, you know, the business move at a, at a greater speed. Um, one of the risks of it, though, is that it puts far more um, emphasis on the relationship of the co-worker. And that's why I looked at um, trusting co-workers is because when you've got this relationship um, manager and subordinate, there's a natural power and, author- um, power and authority within the relationship. So whilst no one or no leader or manager should be relying just on the power or authority to get things done, it just inherently exists. You're higher and I'm lower. And, you know, obviously there's far more dynamic to this, but that, that natural power dynamic is there. As soon as you have co-workers who are working in self-managed teams in organisations that have, um, you know, a flat organisational structure, that power or authority no longer exists, you know, from a hierarchical point of view. So trust becomes far more important within those relationships because, you know, there's no power obligation from one person in a team to do a piece of work um, if it's from co-worker to co-worker. So, you know, and that's why, you know, I, I felt it really re- relevant and also very interesting to look at that dynamic of trust within two people, two people where there's no hierarchical relationship. Um, and that's why, you know, all the things that we've talked about today, you know, are so important, you know, the self-awareness, you know, understanding your values, you know, understanding, you know, um, perceiving trustworthiness through, you know, benevolence becomes so important because the stronger trust can be between these, um, between co-workers means that work becomes, you know, can be done far more efficient. You're not, you're not thinking, oh, that person's not going to do that bit of work or on a more extreme environment, more extreme situation, you don't move into like protective behaviors, you know, which then can really create distance between one per one co-worker and another, because you're basically saying, I don't, trust you for whatever reason, I'm going to protect myself. I'm not going to be vulnerable to you, you know, and then from a business, not only performance wise, but cultural standpoint, you know, if you've got those types of relationships happening within your organization, you know, then it's, you know, it can quickly turn toxic, you know, so you want to be continually fostering, you know, a dynamic and a culture where people can continually open up and make those connections and perceive the trustworthiness based on the three factors that we've talked about. And what about then for people who are like self-employed or solo practitioners? So for for me, I I run my own business. I I have an intern, but that's kind kind of it. And I know for a lot of practitioners who will probably be listening to this would be in a similar situation where it is really just them trying to run a business so i just wonder if there's anything that you haven't said already that you think would be be relevant based on the stuff that you've you looked at as part of the research yeah I th- to be honest with you I, th- I think broadly it's it's all relevant you know to any person in any situation you know trust um you know i gave the example of why it's important to co-workers but you know trust in um 
you know, between two people is fundamental to the relationship, you know. So if you're self-employed, you're a consultant, of, you know, and you work in, you know, the area that you do where it's clients and, you know, consultants, it's critical that there's trust within that relationship. And, you know, you can quickly apply those three sub-factors that we talked about is, you know, does the person that I'm sitting here, do I perceive them to have the ability that, you know, I require them to have? Are they going to be kind to me? Like just generally as a human, are they going to be kind to me? And, you know, do they hold the same values? You know, and as a um, self-employed practitioner, you know, you the better that you know yourself and the better that you can display kindness, love, the better you can display your own values, your own behaviors, you know, that demonstrate who you are as a person. And then obviously, you know, an, an ability within your chosen field, you know, the, the quicker that you'll build trust, you know, and, and uh, the speed at which trust can be built is based on those things. So, you know, the more that you're able to display those um, factors that we've talked about, the quicker that you'll build trust and but also be mindful that you know trust can tr- trust d- doesn't head in just one direction you know yeah. it can fall away mm-hmm. so you know you you've got to be aware of and this is why i guess this is why it comes back to you know authenticity as well is that you know knowing who you are in all those different situations because what may happen is that you might find yourself you know, sleep deprived due to, you know, um, a, your child keeping you up or stress because, you know, you ha- don't have the money to pay for a bills or whatever it might be, you know, how, how do you respond in that type of situation? Do you still um, demonstrate your values when you're under those different stresses? Um, and then because if you don't, then that the trust that you have with that client or that coworker or your romantic partner, you know, can be negatively affected to a degree. Yeah, definitely. And so I want to kind of look at something slightly different, which is you doing the actual research around this thing. And so yeah. I guess like what are certain – I don't know, ideas that the lay public might have or doesn't understand about research or doing a research dissertation? Because I think there's a, a, a bigger um, awareness of ideas around scientific literacy. There's there's ideas about how much the media are playing up certain science claims and, and certain papers. So I guess it would just be, yeah, interesting to hear from your perspective. What, what do you think people don't understand about what it – yeah, I don't what it takes to do a dissertation or, or like just research more generally. Yeah, so I guess um, my I guess I'll I'll just speak from my own experience of doing you know doing a dissertation and you know someone that had done an undergrad degree but hadn't studied for fifteen years had worked in the corporate in, you know corporate world you know that whole time had worked at a reasonably senior level. Um, you know, to then get thrown into, you know, university and then also to then have to write um, a dissertation, you know, research paper. And the one thing I quickly realised was that none of my skill set from a corporate world, well, very little of that of that um, experience that I had was applicable to the research <laughs> environment. You know, the key difference is that you know, from my experience, you know, things, you know, work within the corporate environment, just work quickly. You know, everybody's moving on to the next thing and the next bit and the next bit. And whilst you might work on a project which takes, you know, might, which obviously might take months and might even take, you know, years, there's always other stuff, little stuff going on, you know, moving, 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 moving. And this, you know, it was, it was being honest, because I did two research dissertations, you know, the first one, they both were a real slog, you know, because I think one thing if, if you know, if the people that have never done any research before is, you know, I, I had no idea how much research there is. Like, it's just unbelievable how much research is, you know, um, published on a regular basis, you know, from all different places, from all around the world, um, and, you know, trying to filter that and trying to condense the points, the theories, you know, the the arguments into, you know, 10,000 words, say, 
you know, it is a real skill, you know, and the other thing is that, you know, research is moved so quickly and um, information now is so accessible, you know, that broadly speaking, you know, you really can only be looking at research, you know, say like last three years, five years max, because everybody's taking the research and then building on it and they're changing it and they're challenging it and they're, you know, or they're, you know, they're agreeing with it. Um, you know, that's not to say that obviously there's some seminal papers, and, you know, and, and, I, and I use, I, you know, three seminal papers, like the imposter phenomenon structure hasn't changed since 1985, you know, so you obviously read that paper in depth. Um, the the trustworthiness paper from memory, I think, was like, you know, mid-90s. You know, so they're both older papers, but you know, and and the same could be said across many different theories that, you know, there's points in time where someone really, you know, makes a discovery and then everybody starts building on that. But in terms of the arguments about how those theories are being challenged or being, you know, agreed with, then, you know, you really need to look at the last three years. And it's very, very easy to get lost, to get down the rabbit hole. And, you know, there was times when I was like, what am I actually trying to study here? Like what, what is, you know, what, what am I, what am I trying to um, prove or disprove? Um, and, you know, th- that's where, you know, obviously where a supervisor, which you you know, which you, who you work with, um, you know, is so important because, you know, they've, their role and their, you know, both supervisors had were amazing, you know, support for me of just pulling you, pulling me back on track because, what I, you know, my, 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 even my grasp of the English language, you know, had to change because, you know, I was just using so much fluff, you know, to explain things, you know, which need to be explained far more succinctly, you know, and just move on to the next point. And they literally, you know, they just hammer it into you, you know, what is the point of this sentence? Like, what, what are you trying to say? Because if you don't know, it shouldn't be there. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, as a lay person, I know maybe people, you know, maybe I guess I didn't appreciate just how much work goes into it, you know, how much thought. And I know that sounds, that probably sounds, probably sounds a little bit ignorant and naive. Now, obviously, I know a huge amount of work goes into it, but I mean, like, the, 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 the thought generally into, like, literally every word and every sentence that gets written into a paper, you know, it's really scrutinised, Um so yeah, it's 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 a it's a massive undertaking. But you know, if there is anybody listening to this, thinking, oh wow, you know, whether it be psychology or any other, you know, um, any other field that you know they're thinking about moving into, it was the hardest thing I've ever ever done. But it was also by far the most rewarding, by far. You know, because it's 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 rare. Well, it, for me, it was rare. It's, it, I, I don't know if there'll be many times in my life where I'm like, right, I've got, say, four months or five months and not all that I'm doing, but I'm really just going to dedicate myself to writing this paper, you know. And it is it is exhausting. You've got to, you've got to, you know, read, you know, these papers, which, you know, could be 20, 25 pages long. They are dense, you know. They <laughs> yeah, are. They're not they, easy to read. They are not easy to read. And I think you even said to me when you're reading my paper, you know, it was dense. And for me, I was like, wow, like in a way that I kind of took that as a compliment because I was, oh, well, I've written a paper that, you know, that obviously has the same, you know, requires the same level of thought that, you know, or, you know, um, emotional energy into, you know, reading because, yeah, because, you know, there's a lot of heavy information in these, you know, but if you – get to the essence of what each of these papers are going to say or trying to say or do say, then, um, you know, obviously it's hugely insightful and, you know, hugely exciting when you start getting onto some certain themes because you then start, I guess, really like following the crumbs of, of knowledge that you read one paper and then you're like, all right, where was that cited? And you see how that person's built on that idea or challenged it or critiqued it. You know, oh, that's really cool. You know, so it's a very rewarding experience when you get on the, get on those, um, you know, when you build momentum like that. But, uh, yeah, it was, it's a, it's a great experience. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, generally anybody that reads research is just, you know, to have the appreciation of, you know, on the whole, you know, because obviously there's there's a lot of research out there, but on the whole, you know, so much effort goes into these, you know. So, 
um, and, you know, and a lot of thought, especially if they're being published. You know, I'm, and I'm starting the process of maybe getting this pub, this paper published, working with my supervisor on that process. You know, and that requires, like, you know, another whole level of um, scrutiny, you know, and, and being challenged about how, you know, the findings and the way that I'm presenting the findings, you know, are going to be told. So, you know, if you're reading, you know, a published paper, you know, you can take confidence that, you know, it has been challenged to an inch of its life. Yeah, I would actually kind of fight back against that a little bit and just say, like, as part of your course, did you do much on the replication crisis? Because I would say even like with psychology in particular, there's been a lot of looking at the research that's been done and then not being able to, to replicate those those findings. So I think, yeah, there's people spend a lot of time doing things, but it doesn't always justify or mean that the results that, that came about as part of that um, bit of research are actually correct. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, and that's why, you know, I try to say broadly because there is a lot of bad research here, you know, I won't say bad, poor, poorly constructed research, you know, and obviously if it is published, certain publications have, you know, um, stronger um scrutiny of papers than others do so you know I, I i guess i should say that is that i'm not broadly saying you know it's all correct and in terms of replication yeah definitely you know it's it's you know i think it's important that the any research is able to be able to be tested again in different circumstances you know whether it be a different culture different demographic whatever it might be or, or exactly the same and just say, look, we're going to just try and do this exactly the same and see where we, we you know, what, what result we get, we, we get, um, by doing it. So the, um, yeah, I agree with you. I guess just to kind of close this out, um, is there any advice that you haven't mentioned or any, anything you would want, like, I'm going to ask for like an individual, but also a HR department, but for an individual to take away from the research that you've done or this conversation. Yeah. And again, I, you know, it's, very simply, it's about, you know, spending time getting to know you, you know, whether that's by yourself or with someone like yourself or with a therapist or whatever it might be, depending on where you're at and, you know, how you're feeling is just getting to know you because, the stronger relationship, the, the deeper relationship that you can have with, with yourself, you know, and know yourself in a variety of different situations, both good and bad, you know, the, the, the stronger the positive well-being you'll have and also the stronger connection that you'll have with others yeah. um, and the more that you'll be able to trust and, um, you know, and so forth. And then from an organisational point of view, you know, the number one takeout is, you know, is, is, is for me is to create spaces where people feel emotionally safe, where they feel that they can be authentic, where they feel that they can come in and be themselves without fear of being judged. Um, and, you know, and, and people have such difficult lives, you know, um, you know, sleep deprived, sleep deprived due to children, you know, um, financial woes, you know, stresses with partners, stress with the family, bereavement, all, you know, all these types of things, you know, weigh on people and people spend so much time at work. You know, the, the last thing we should be doing or, you know, as a society as a whole is work being another stress, you know, yeah. due to the manager, due to the leader, due to the culture, whatever it might be. So, you know, it's just to – obviously we live in a capitalist free market society, you know, where people's after – you know, companies are after growth and growth and all these things. But, you know, there's this really nice – well, it's slowly happening, you know, people really considering like – you know, you know the importance of the individual and the port and the importance of that person to you know fulfill fulfilled from their work. But not beyond that, just to feel a connection as a human, you know, not to go into work and you know feel isolated. But you know, just for people to to do something as simple as say, you know, how are you? You know, to yeah. have that connection because um, you know I worked in places, I worked in teams where you know, that, that doesn't happen. And I know that applies to a lot of places. Um, and, you know, for, and I think it's, it is the organisational organization responsibility, the HR's responsibility, the leadership, and also just generally employee responsibility is just to create that space.
Well, look, Rupert, this has been this has been great. I really love chatting with you and getting to find out more about the the research you did and and your perspective on things. Um, is there anywhere that you want people to be pointed towards in sort of like a, a website or social media stuff? I mean, you're you're not the usual person I have on the the podcast in terms of the fact that you're not a practitioner, etc. But yeah, is there anywhere you want to point people? Yeah, the the. Um... The, I guess the easiest way to get in touch with me is through LinkedIn. You know, so okay. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you can. I'm obviously happy to, for you to post a, a link to my cool. LinkedIn I can profile. Do that. um, that's probably the easiest way for people to get in touch with me. You know, like like I said at the start of the chat, you know, I was obviously going. You know, the plan was to go down the consultancy path, but you know, I'm now very much um, running a startups drinks business. But you know, I'm. I love having coffees with people. I love catching up with people. So I'm, you know, more than happy to, you know, to connect and to share ideas with anybody that would like to. So just, you know, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Perfect. All right. Well, I will put that in the show notes. And, yeah, thank you once again for coming on the show. This has been great. Cool, mate. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Real Health Radio. If you are interested in more details, you can find them at the Seven Health website. That's www.7sevn-health.com.